Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. And today, I want to discuss the future. And more specifically, what the future is going to be like, and how can we even predict what the future is going to be like? It's one of those things where it's really, really difficult, isn't it? Because quite often you'll see people trying to predict the future, and they get it so wrong, because it could go in any direction, couldn't it? When I was a kid, I remember watching films like Back to the Future Part 2 and seeing, you know, all of these hoverboards and, and flying cars everywhere and thinking to myself, wow, 2015 is going to be amazing. And I'd actually sit there trying to work out what age I was going to be by the time that films like Back to the Future actually were, you know, the, the time period within it actually came to be. And I was wondering, you know, thinking to myself, wow, I'm going to be in my 40s. I'm going to be a really old man with a walking stick, you know. Bearing in mind, I was young. And it's quite interesting how you see films like that and you think to yourself, wow, we're, you know, we've gone way past 2015 now and the future is nowhere near like they said it would be, nowhere near as advanced. And one of the things I remember the producer Bob Gale saying was when writing a film, there is no way of predicting the future. So what they tried to do was they tried to get 50% predictions and 50% ga as many gags as possible to try and fit in so that even if it didn't come to pass, at least people would look at that movie, see the gags and laugh at it anyway. But one of the ways you could get an accurate way of predicting the future is to look to the past. For example, um, if you look at what people have said in the past about the future see what they got right and what they got wrong. You can kind of use that to then speculate yourself. So today, we have a video from the BBC archive. It's from 1964, and it's from Arthur C. Clarke. So Arthur C. Clarke, very well known in the sci-fi world. For example, the thing that he wrote that's got to be the biggest thing he's ever done, I would argue, is probably 2001, A Space Odyssey, which then became the eventual film with Stanley Kubrick. And where, you know, he... He's been known for being quite a predictor of the future. He's also known for being quite optimistic as well. Quite optimistic at humans' achievement, technology, and things like that. He talks about things like robots, the use of satellites around the Earth, and he was a big believer in renewable energy sources, even back then. So I figured it'd be quite interesting to see what he actually predicted about the future. So, let's get into the video. Horizon filmed him at the World's Fair in New York. He's Arthur Clarke. Trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation because the prophet invariably falls between two stools. If his predictions sound at all reasonable, you can be quite sure that in 20 or at most 50 years, the progress of science and technology has made him seem ridiculously conservative. On the other hand, if by some miracle a prophet could describe the future exactly as it was going to take place, his predictions would sound so absurd, so far-fetched, that everybody would laugh him to scorn. This has proved to be true in the past, and it will undoubtedly be true, even more so, of the century to come. See, I think that's quite true, actually. Um, the one thing I would say, though, I don't know, I mean, certainly in this time period, I don't know if people would throw you to scorn. Certainly, I think before the 20th century, if people would have predicted how far we'd come in the 20th century, you know, I think people would have, would have, wouldn't have realised necessarily. Because if you think about it, time is pretty uneven. What I mean by that is, if you think of all the advances we've made over time, it's mostly been in the 20th century onwards. It's not evenly spread throughout. So... Um, but generally speaking, I think what he's saying is the truth, isn't it? Because, you know, it's kind of like if you do predict the future and you get it spot on, people in your contemporary time would, would think, you know, no way. You know, the guy's clearly wrong. Or, you know, whereas, as I said, the other side of the field is that you're going to get it wrong because you're going to be too conservative. Times are going to change where things grow exponentially and sometimes you get it wrong, don't you? You think it's going to, you know, um, progress at a certain pace, whereas sometimes things can take off and they can go a lot faster. So, yeah, I think he's, I think he's right in what you're saying, definitely. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Now, that's been optimistic. So, if what optimistic. I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I'll fail completely. <laughs> only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable have we any chance of visualising the future 
as it really will happen. Let's start by looking at the city of the future. Some people think that it, it will be like this. And they're quite right. Suddenly got that wrong, didn't he? In fact, everything you see now already exists. All the materials, all the ideas, these things could be put into practice immediately. But what about the city of the day after tomorrow? Say, the year 2000. I think it will be completely different. In fact, it may not even exist at all. Oh, I'm not thinking of the atom bomb and the next stone age. Say. I'm thinking of the incredible breakthrough which has been made possible by developments in communications, particularly the transistor and, above all, the communication satellite. These things will make possible a world in which we can be in instant contact with each other, wherever we may be, where we can contact our friends anywhere on Earth, even if we don't know their actual physical location. See, now that's true, isn't it? That's actually true, because when you look at it now, we can, we can call people by the phone, we can um, video conference people over the internet, over the phone, over anything. And so that's actually true. But the whole city of the future was just, you know, it's very Jetsons, isn't it? Where there are multiple big buildings... But the kind of the 50s and 60s version of the future was almost like multiple levels, wasn't it? You've almost got things, buildings, but things sticking out and things, you know, and like hover cars zipping through and stuff like that. Very Jetsons kind of version of the future. But I like the way he said that he thought it would happen because that technology is based now. Clearly it hasn't. If anything, I think he'd have been shocked at the future because when he'd have come and seen towns and cities, they're mostly similar to what they were back in the 60s, aren't they? Yes, there are more roads, but... When you think of it, and this was recorded, when did I say it was, 1964? Um, you know, motorways, let's say, take the UK, for example, motorways were already built. The main road infrastructure was already built. The electrical grid for electricity was already built. So, actually, you know, in terms of the technology and the home things that we have, yes, things have changed. But if you look at it on a grander level, um, for example... Cars are still the same, still four wheels, still, you know, still go mainly on the road. You've still got planes. Planes are largely still the same, aren't they? Um, the, the travel between areas, the cities themselves, yes, they've grown, but they are still largely the same. Still houses, still flats slash apartments, still, um, you know, they weren't quite so metropolis, metropolis type things. They're, they're mainly the same. So in that respect, he was kind of wrong. And the thing is, the question is, why are there metropolis type cities? And generally, if you look at most of them, even in the common in the in the contemporary world we live in now, it's mainly for space. Places like New York or say Hong Kong are prime examples of these. They're built that way for they're built upwards for space, not because it you know it was something futuristic. You know, um, an architect year uh, uh, like in the 20th century I, I think it was 20th century it might have even been the 19th century and I forget his name I think it was American you know figured out that you could put effectively a metal frame put concrete around it and then you can build a, you know a larger superstructure um, so that's what happened in places of limited space it, it made sense to do that but I guess my point is these things were built out of necessity rather than because it was just a futuristic endeavor that would be, look great on you know on humankind's futuristic crib sheet, if you like. For their actual physical location. It will be possible in that age, perhaps only 50 years from now, for a man to conduct his business from Tahiti or Bali, just as well as he could from London. That's definitely true. Like now, for example, you can work or you can work from home. Um, you know, with internet connections the way they are now, you know, it's quite easy for you to be able to communicate with other members of your office to be able to hold meetings and to be able to do let's say an office job for example like you said a business person you know they could do it from Tahiti just as well as they could do it from London from New York you know from anywhere really from New Delhi they could do it from anywhere in the world quite conveniently now so that's certainly good a good thing about the future and that's certainly something that I agree is exactly what that's exactly what's happened so he's bang on right about that that's definitely happened isn't it that's definitely the truth about the current future or the present in fact, if it proves worthwhile, almost any executive skill, any administrative skill, even any physical skill, could be made independent of distance. I am perfectly serious when I suggest that one day we may have brain surgeons in Edinburgh operating on patients in New Zealand. 
Now here, that does sound far-fetched, doesn't it? The, phys- the, the you know, certainly as you were saying, an administrative job or a job that is not physical, i.e. does not require you to use your own hands, you know, like... It, it's very difficult to imagine somebody being able to fix a, a leaky pipe, you know, a, a plumbing issue um, remotely, or and the same thing with brain surgery. But actually, that's not as far fetched as it sounds. Certainly, in um, you know more expensive, richer hospitals, for example, they do have ro- surgical robots that are capable of performing surgical tasks, whether either controlled remotely or whether they have a f- physical program that they run on themselves. I'm not entirely sure, but it's certainly possible. Obviously, he was wrong in the fact that it doesn't happen in the mainstream um, after the year 2000. But I can see why he thought it. And it does make sense that it would possibly, in, even in our lifetimes for the future, be something that may be able to happen. Certainly, we know now, for example, things are done laparoscopically all the time in, in hospitals. But you're still hands-on. So that part, not maybe not quite. Not yet, anyway. In the future? Sure, yeah, I think that's going to be definitely possible. When that time comes, the whole world will have shrunk to a point. And the traditional role of the city as a meeting place for a man would have ceased to make any sense. Mm. In fact, men will no longer commute. They will communicate. That's true. They won't have to travel for business anymore. They'll only travel for pleasure. I mean, that happens now. People do still travel for business, and they most certainly do travel for pleasure. But yeah, that's certainly true, isn't it, in business and homeworking. Since COVID, it's really common, especially in the UK, and I and I hear people in the United States for a similar thing, where they are definitely working from home a lot more. They do commute to work. Maybe, let's say they do like a, hy- a hybrid situation where they maybe work like two days a week in the office and then they work the other three days at home. But most definitely people communicate now more than they would... Um, commute. So I think that's most definitely true, even as it stands in tw- uh, in 2023. But let's face it, the technology was there, but we didn't really use it as much as we could have done. It wasn't really until we had a huge um, disaster or medical emergency, a pandemic on the scale of COVID, that really changed the way we looked at socialising, gathering in cities, gathering in big groups, and when we looked at home working or hybrid solutions. So in a way, it wasn't the future that precipitated that. Perhaps more population growth and um, like a, a medical pandemic or an emergency of some kind, a physical emergency, that's what's effectively precipitated it. Or precipitate is the wrong word. Catalyze is probably a better way of putting it, perhaps. That pandemic catalyzed the um, march to a home working or a hybrid working environment faster than an ordinary time you know going into the future would have done so but I can see why he would have said it and certainly he said about he, he touched on something else about cities being meeting places which made which to be honest made me think about the industrial revolution cities were always a a, con, uh, a, a convergence for trade and things like that but you know, with the Industrial Revolution and certainly with cities being industrialised, the work was in the city. You had to migrate to the city. The work wasn't in your home. There wasn't a factory in your home. It was in the city. So you did see, didn't you, a population in the 1800s, a, a mass population flock from the countryside to the cities. Whereas, and that was certainly still true in the 1960s, whereas now certainly in the, in, in the I can only speak for the UK because I live in the UK, you're definitely seeing a lot more people. I know so many friends that have chosen to move out of a town or city, especially when they wanted to start a family, and they all moved out into the country. And because of this hybrid working, you know, the internet, the computer, we were able to do these things now, especially, you know, in 2023. So um, I think it's interesting. It, it seemed like a logical prediction for 1964. It didn't happen, or it has only happened because of other things, but essentially he's still right. So... You can't argue with the result. You know, sometimes it's about the result, isn't it? And he's right. I only hope that when that day comes and when the city is abolished, the whole world isn't turned into one giant suburb. No, it's never going to happen. The city is never going to be abolished. It's never going to be abolished. I'm telling you, it, it, that's my 100%. That's my, sto- that's my predict- stone cold, no offence to the wrestler guy, prediction for the future is, yeah, cities will never be abolished. Even if they're not something where people live and work in as much, they will always be there as a tourism 
thing, you know. So much history has happened in cities, they're never just going to disappear. So they're always going to be there. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. In that world of the future, we will not be the only intelligent creatures. One of the oh coming techniques will be what we might oh, call obvious. bioengineering, the development of intelligent and useful servants among the other animals on this planet, particularly the great apes and in the oceans, the dolphins and whales. You know, it's a scandal of which we should be thoroughly ashamed that prehistoric man tamed all the domestic animals we have today. We haven't added one in the last 5,000 years. Mm. It's about time we did so. And with our mm. present knowledge of animal psychology and genetics, we could certainly solve the servant problem uh, with the help of the uh, monkey kingdom. Uh, of course, eventually... <laughs> That's proper Planet of the Apes there, that is. That is proper Planet of the Apes there. It's like um, Arthur P. Jacobs from 20th Century Fox must have been literally scribbling notes when he saw this. You know, um, and again, I don't agree with it at all. Um, I do not agree with that, at, even remotely, at all. There was this talk years ago, I get it, um, perhaps in those days, but no, I think even in 2023, the idea of it, it's not a servant so much as a slave, if you think of it that way. And it's not would never ever be tolerated now. I think if you did develop, I think like they said with animals doing things, and it is very, um, as I say, it's very Planet of the Apes. Um, is it? I forget the guy's name. Pierre Boulle was that the French author who wrote Planet of the Apes? Um, that's the sort of thing that he sort of said about. And actually, it probably was in the sixties. Maybe yeah, it was sixties, wasn't it? Yeah, chimpanzees. I think was it share the most DNA markers with humans. And I forget the... Was it 98% of their DNA is exactly the same as humans? But they haven't evolved to that sort of intelligence level. But there are obviously there were experiments where they communicated with chimpanzees and they, they could carry out like a rudimentary... You know, they had an idea of what they wanted, for example. They could tell whether they were hot or whether they were cold, whether they were hungry, whether they weren't hungry, whether they were tired and wanted to go to sleep or not, things like that. And certainly Planet of the Apes... There's a disease that apparently wipes out all the cats and dogs, therefore um, humans take on intelligent apes as pets. And you can see why, even in that novel series, the apes became obviously even more intelligent and started to get an idea of civilization and started to realise that they were being captured and put in slavery and things like that, and they decided to rebel. So no, I don't think that's true at all, and I think that really dates this. It just wouldn't happen. People would not accept it. People would reject it completely. And I think even to a certain extent, we're talking a lot about artificial intelligence at the moment. Things like chat GPT, let's be clear, are not really artificial intelligence. It's not really... Artificial intelligence is where you... I, I define it personally as thinking for yourself, making judgments for yourself, learning yourself, developing your own personality, not asking ask something a question like chat gpt a question and it can it can vaguely look across the internet and then bring back different answers and and quickly um it's not quite the same is it and even when let's say there's a, a computer or a robot artificial intelligence in my opinion there will be huge debates at the time in the future and it could be 10 years could be 20 years could be longer but I think there will be debates on whether it is slavery and whether it is right. Even I think, and people will argue: is a computer alive? Is it not alive? And things like that. And that's why I think people like Elon Musk are really trying to, you know, in the public, uh, like in the news and giving interviews, and they're talking about the dangers of artificial intelligence and things because it is true, you know, that it's going to be a debate for the future. And I don't necessarily agree with him that there will be slaves, or I don't even think. That there will always be conven technological conveniences, if you know what I mean. Back from the microwave and the electric can opener in the 1960s to, you know, a, a sky box that records your TV to, you know, an auto drive car. There will always be conveniences, but they won't be intelligent conveniences, I don't think, because I think there will be that ban. People will make that debate, and then they'll have they'll ban it. I don't think they'll allow it. And I certainly don't think that there'll be animals that will be trained to be human pets like that as much, any more than there are now. I mean, you could argue cats and dogs are trained. Um, but they're not. there's not going to be a substitute for that, in my opinion. I don't think so. No, I don't think so, no. But this is just my opinion, of course. It's not fact. 
And, if, you know, what do you think? Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you think. Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm wrong? Do you think I'm crazy, you know, for what I'm saying? Or, um, like a chap on my previous video, do you think I'm talking too much and we should carry on with the video? <laughs> Our super chimpanzees would start forming trade unions and we right back where we started. Yeah, However, the most topical. intelligent inhabitants of that future world won't be men or monkeys. Machines? They'll be machines. The remote descendants of today's computers. Now, the present-day electronic brains are complete morons, but this will not be true in another generation. They will start to think, and eventually they will completely outthink their makers. Is this depressing? I don't see why it should be. We superseded the Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal men, and we presume we're an improvement. I think we should regard it as a privilege to be stepping stones to higher things. I suspect that organic or biological evolution has about come to its end, and we are now at the beginning of inorganic or mechanical evolution, which will be thousands of times swifter. It's probably true, I think, yeah. Funnily enough, I was reading an article this morning, um, and they were saying that scientists from the Netherlands have actually found that the the actual, the highest general age that humans can live to, men it's 115, women it's 114, and that's if you do everything right in terms of you have a, you know the right diet, you exercise regularly, you know you don't have any like major life injuries or conditions, and um, yeah, I don't think humans are going to evolve any further than they are now. Um, although there are some that say that the brains in particular, you know, like Albert Einstein used more of his brain and if humans use more of their brain that they'll be able to, you know, turn into energy like in, you know, that uh, TV series Stargate SG-1 and, you know, ascend to a higher plane. I'm not so sure. I, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think it is. Um, because if you look at it, humans can always learn generally, but their intelligence level is pretty stand a pretty standard scale. You always get people like Albert Einstein who go above that scale. But generally speaking, they, the humans aren't going to evolve past where they are now. And to say that, uh, we, you know, we should be happy that we are a stepping stone on the next evolutionary trail, I wouldn't say I'd be happy with that at all. And who knows, maybe um, Neanderthals weren't happy either. Who knows? Um, but I don't think... I think even machines will be different than people because the one thing you can all say about a human is there's always that flesh and blood, there's always that physical feeling, that physical tactile sensation... That's something really that a machine can't replace. And maybe it will be able to to a certain extent. But I don't think machines will um, see humans as inferior. I think they'll see things as different, like humans see machines as different. Machines certainly will think faster. They can process faster. They can expand in a way that, you know, a machine could easily have like a 1,000 IQ or a 2,000 IQ. But they'd never be able to feel the sensations that a human would feel in, in a certain way, in a physical way, certainly, in a theoretical way they would. So I don't know. I, I don't agree with that at all, really. I don't think. No, I'm not saying that. I think artificial intelligence may in fact happen. You know, you may be able to talk to Hal or whatever from, you know, 2001, but... I don't think it's quite going to be as bleak. As, he, he makes it seem positive, whereas I take that as a bit bleak, actually. But I don't think it's going to be like that. But even if the future does belong to the robots, our bodies and our brains still have immense untapped potentialities. For example, to cope with the information explosion, we may develop a machine for recording information directly onto the brain, as today we can record a symphony on tape. So we may one day be able to become instant experts, uh, learning Chinese overnight, for example. I think that's true, actually. Yeah. Um, the thing is, and if you want to look at there's there's two there's two things I talk about here. The first is about recording and imprinting something and then being able to sense it later on having a direct sensory input to the brain if that's something that you're interested in there's a film called strange days that came out i believe it was 1996 uh directed by Catherine bigelow and she talks that's that's the film that she this is the sort of film that she talks about here where they have like a little mini disc player type thing in it and you can physically put like this squib which and uh, you know interfaces electrical impulses with the brain and it can record what you're going through. Another film that's similar was a 1980 feel, a 1983 film directed by um, Doug Trumbull called um, Brainstorm. That's very similar, where you could actually record something 
and then play it back later on into your brain. So as he, as Arthur C. Clarke here said, you could learn things a lot faster that way, or you could the physical feeling and sensation. You know, you could do things without taking risks. I do firmly believe that will happen. Definitely, as an, it's like just like a virtual reality game that you have now. When I was a kid, virtual reality was around. So don't think by any means that virtual reality is new. It's not. VR has been around ever since I was a kid. Perhaps not in high res- high resolution as it is now for, with modern games, but it certainly was around. And the next level is to be able to feel the sensations by tapping directly into the brain. And yes, I do think that will be possible. But the problem with learning is there will be learning aids, but its retention is key to learning. That's why many of us, for example, like like me, I'm not intelligent because I cannot retain knowledge very easily. I sometimes will forget things. You know, um, having that recall is just as important as it is to be able to learn it, to assimilate the knowledge, to understand it. You, assimilation is one, uh, understanding is another, and then being able, a retention is another enti- thing entirely. And while she may be able to do what he's suggesting, unless you had a physical storage device, you know, Johnny Mnemonic style, where Keanu Reeves, where you have like, I don't know what he had, was it like a, a 10 gigabyte hard drive, which is obviously literally nothing in today's storage capacity. But let's say you had a petabyte drive, which even na- even in 30 years probably won't sound as big as it does now. A petabyte drive attached... Do I think that's possible? Yeah, definitely. Do I think it would happen? I, again, I don't know. Because all of these ethical questions, people always, when they're predicting the future, it's easy to predict technology, but everybody forgets about ethics. And there will be ethical questions that will be asked. For example, like with chat GPT now in schools, people are always asking the question, is it fair if you have access to the internet and chat GPT, it can provide you with the perfect essay response to a test or to us in, you know, when you're learning in class. And people will always ask, is it an unfair advantage? For those who have implants, and there may be people that, for example, get implants because of cognitive impairment, perhaps there was an accident at birth or something like that. And then people then ask the question, you know, will you be more intelligent to other people and will it be fair to the rest of the population who either can't afford it or whom want to naturally evolve? And there'll be all these questions where would people enhance them enhance themselves to compete? And I think the ethical questions will come into play, kind of like they do now with um, stem cell research and, you know, being able to grow organs or body parts or things like that there's all these ethical questions that come in even things like genetic engineering genetic tampering you know the ethical questions the scientific community as a whole are generally quite ethical um, and they will come together and say no i'm sorry we're outlawing this we're banning this so i think the bigger problem will necessarily be what will happen when people still carry on and then try and gain an advantage by doing things the world really needs to come together far more than it has so that when things like certain things are outlawed for the good of humanity then everyone has to be enforcing it and on board with it um so yeah i think they'll be even bigger problems not the question isn't necessarily are things technologically possible in the future i think the real question is should we do them ethically that's an even bigger question at least in my mind anyway or we may be able to recall completely memories of past events so that we seem to relive them. In fact, techniques are already known for doing this in a rather limited way at the present. Alternatively, we may prefer to totally erase past unpleasant memories. Our bodies will also be more efficient and they'll last longer. After all, it's only in this century that a patient had a better than 50% chance of any improvement when he was treated by his doctors. One of the great medical That's discoveries of the near future will be a method of suspended animation so that a man can sleep away down the centuries and in this manner travel into the future. Now, this technique, which may possibly be based on deep freezing, will one day be used to send into the future people suffering from diseases or ailments beyond the ability of present-day medical science to cure. Though I don't really know how one will calculate the health insurance contributions to pay for medical treatment 500 years hence. 
where you'd have to <laughs> yeah he's right isn't he you'd have to you'd have to have a savings account and then hope inflation will catch up with you and you'll have loads more in there yeah, it's funny actually cryogenic freezing was often discussed in the past but it hasn't happened has it um or you hear the odd case of it all walt disney's head was frozen or you know you hear like a case where there's there was supposedly going to be cryogenic centers i've never heard of it i, I perhaps they are there i've never heard of them um I don't necessarily know that cryogenic freezing would be would be viable. I mean, we talk about cell membranes. You know, obviously water expands, cell membranes break, etc. However, the idea of being able to slow down the heart so it beats like Star Trek talked about in Space Seed in season one, you know, the Khan episode, they talk about slowing down the human's heart rate to three beats per minute. But then at the same time, that, that doesn't guarantee that the human body won't still age. Um, so I don't know how, I don't necessarily think cryogenic freezing is going to be possible, in, if I'm honest. You know, but then, like, it's the same, in the same way, I don't think transporters are going to be possible either, Star Trek style. Perhaps, no, I can't even see it. Because, firstly, you've got the Heisenberg effect, you know, like, that that is in the German scientist and you know, all of the molecules and all of the atoms are all moving around really, really, really fast. And how can you map them when you consider how many trillions of billions of molecules there are in the body or atoms or, you know, how is how are you ever going to be able to map those? You're just not. There's going to be no scanner that does that. And the second thing is, even if you were able to invent a transporter, if you take a copy of one thing and then and, and then create a facsimile somewhere else, that facsimile isn't really you. It's just a copy of you. So effectively, you cease to exist. You die over here. The facsimile that is reproduced over here is a carbon copy of you with your memories, perhaps, but it's not you. And it never will be you. I'm sorry, it just won't be. You may think it will, but it won't be. And yes, I do believe in a soul. And you, a soul is something that cannot be transferred through a machine. It just cannot be. It's just not possible. And the, the thing that comes out the other end, you don't know what it's going to be. So that's another thing I don't think will ever happen. Things like transporting and stuff. I think that there'll be more convenience, way, more convenient ways of getting around that certainly transportation I can't see happening. And even if it could, what appears at the other end won't be you. Another use of suspended animation will be for the long-range exploration of space. Hmm. In this way, us short-lived creatures will be able to travel enormous distances. Although we may not, of course, be so short-lived in the future, because even immortality may be on the cards one day. However, even without I immortality, we may be able to make journeys lasting thousands of years, and such journeys will be necessary if we ever wish, wish to cross the enormous gulfs which separate from us from the stars. Distance is so great that even light, traveling at 600 million miles every hour, takes years to cross them. But why should we attempt these immense voyages? Well, because it seems fairly certain that, at least at this moment in time, there are no other intelligent creatures in our own solar system. We'll have to go out to the stars to, to meet them. For certainly, out there among the 100,000 million other suns of our universe, there must be many civilizations perhaps far higher than our own. So, yeah, I think there's several things to unpack there, I think. I think, number one, it's far more likely, in my opinion, that there'll be something like an Einstein Rosen Bridge kind of thing, you know, like a wormhole kind of thing. Far more likely than it is a fast rocket that gets you very, you know, because obviously with Einstein's, um, you know, law of relativity and whatnot. And it's one of those things that Einstein hasn't been proven wrong yet, to my knowledge, on any theory he's ever come up with. Never. Never proven wrong. Never. Not on one thing. That I know of. There maybe there has been, you know, let me know in the comments if it's true. But uh, as far as I'm aware, no. Which means that if you have a rocket that goes really, really, really fast, like an engine propulsion, the sooner you get to the speed of light, everything changes, you know. And not only that, it's like what he's talking about is a way of getting around it by you still go really slow speeds, but it takes a long time because you're in suspended animation. Now, let's get let's get over this whole idea. Let's pretend suspended animation works. And, you know, I'm totally wrong. And it, we do find a way of doing it, freezing people and bringing them back to life. The question is, what's going to be on Earth when you when you come back? You're not going to come back to the same people. They're all going to be dead. They're all going to be gone. So it's kind of like, well, by the time you get there, <laughs> and it's kind of like that Lost in Space from 1998, um, where, you know, they jump through a wormhole and get to a planet, 
and then Earth has increased in technology so much that they've now got ships that can get there and go do far more, and they've done far more in the time it's taken them to get from A to B. And then you've got all sorts of things in space, you know, like that could cause damage to a, a ship or whatever. And, and then we talk. Then that aside, the wormhole seems to be the only logical way, in my opinion, and it will be proven, and it will be able to. It will happen. But then the, what forces happen when you go through a wormhole? Who knows? That's for, for future people to work out. But when you think of it another way as well is intelligent life. Is there intelligent life in the universe? Now, sheer maths and statistics say yes, there must be. Um, and I say that because when he said a thousand million planets, he was by far understating it. When You know, they say there's this saying that says... There is, for every grain of sand there is on a huge beach, effectively, that's how many planets there are in the universe. And I don't even think that's even accurate. I mean, even with what we see with telescopes, and as far out as we can see, bearing in mind it takes light a long time to get from there to here, there are so many galaxies, so many planets. And and now we have things like the Kepler observatory where we're looking at this Goldi goldilocks zone where you've got a star and a planet and how and when a planet reaches a certain distance from a star where it's not too hot not too cold you get water you can get life and we now have identified i don't even know how many planets 30 40 50 all, all within distance of earth that eventually will be not in my lifetime certainly will, will be able to be traveled to so the chances are if you take all of those planets in all of those galaxies and all of those universes that, that that could exist or do exist that we even know about in terms of what we can visually see, even if the odds are one in a million that life could evolve to human level, that's nothing compared to the number of planets there are in the universe. And if humans were either were evolved or created on their you know on Earth, why couldn't God have created them somewhere else. Why couldn't, if they evolved, why couldn't they evolve somewhere else? Why? Why would we, there's, is there anywhere that says that humans are the only ones? I don't know. Perhaps there is. Let me know in the comments. I don't know. But if humans evolved or humans were created, why couldn't others be created in other places? And one of the things that I like to say is, you know, one in a billion sounds like a, a really high odds. But when there are, trillions and trillions and trillions of quadrillions worth of lottery draws happening every millisecond that one in a billion odds doesn't seem that high anymore when you think of it like that and that's what we know that's just what we know about now imagine what we know in the future the first contact with intelligent extraterrestrials will be the greatest adventure in the future of man that's true it may not happen for centuries but one day it will come I think that's true. Meanwhile, near at home, there's plenty to do in this solar system on the moon and planets. Today, we can just reach the moon. Tomorrow, men will be living there. A hundred years from now, some men will call it home. I think that's true. At the moment, it's a very unattractive kind of place to imagine as a home, and this is true of all the planets. That's true, but... The thing is, people say, well, why would they do that? Why would they go and live on the moon? Well, the answer is, for example, minerals and ore. Because the moon, at the moment, it doesn't make sense because there are minerals and ore on Earth. So why would you spend, you know, a huge amount of money going to space to get minerals and ore? But when you consider you want to do construction for ships, it makes sense to construct spaceships up in space because then you don't have that logistical problem of getting them from Earth to space, which which takes a lot of, a lot of fuel, a lot of expense. You know, if you're going to send them, assemble them in space, well, it makes sense. And things like the moon, it won't just be for population reasons because the Earth was overpop it will be overpopulated. It's going to be for reasons like ore, mining, minerals. You know, things like um, the film Outland from 1981. People are going to be mining from different moons, and then there won't be this e e there won't be this um, ecological impact as much because there'll be no one living there. So you've got to be careful, obviously. You don't want to be in a situation like you are with H.G. Wells as a time machine where, you know, they start drilling into the moon and then it all explodes and then it causes gravitational shears on the Earth that destroy the planet or destroy life. You don't want to go too far. But, yeah, I think people will go there purely because of the commercial interest in it. And even for flying, going to another planet, you know, there'll be, there'll be loads of commercial reasons to go to the moon, 100%. There's not one on which unprotected men could live. 
or on which any form of life as we know it could exist, with the possible exception of Mars. However, a hundred years from now, things will be very different. Maybe. With the techniques which we are now acquiring, it will one day be possible to modify the environments on at least some of the planets so that men can live there without space terraforming or airtight cities. Yeah, so there he's talking about terraforming, changing the atmosphere of a planet so that it would adapt it to Earth. Um, maybe possible in the future, maybe like in a thousand years, but it would be easier just to create a dome, wouldn't it? Create a dome and then live in an air dome or something. The technique for this has been called planetary engineering, and one astronomer has coined the very optimistic phrase, the reconstruction of the solar system. Looking as far into the technological future as I dare, I'd like to describe the invention to end all inventions. I call it the replicator, and it's simply a duplicating mm. machine. But it's a duplicating machine that can make an exact copy of anything. Now, we're already familiar with perfect copies of printing, of pictures, and of sounds. Yet, the camera and the tape recorder would have seemed miraculous to our ancestors. True. And uh, to a medieval monk, who perhaps in his whole life only saw a few dozen books, each one patiently copied by hand, our present world, in which literally millions of books exist, would again have seemed absolutely inconceivable. True. Can we imagine a world in which objects can be made as easily as today we can make books? Yeah, I think we can. Um, I mean, I'm not talking about 3D printing. That's something entirely different. Um, but in theory, you know, because you, you can 3D print all sorts of stuff. But what, you know, what he's talk what he's talking about is a replicator. And actually, funnily enough, you can look at Star Trek for things like that. Because believe it or not, I think they said even in Star Trek, the single biggest thing that helped humans after first contact, obviously, with Vulcans and whatnot, and yes, I am talking a bit science fiction, I'm going to be nerdy now, was the Replicator, because the Replicator, if you, I don't know if you like ever watch Star Trek and you remember, a lot of Trekkies will tell you, um, that's what cured poverty on Earth, Replicator, because effectively it means that you can create your own clothes, your own food, your own heat, you know, you can create anything you want from it, and that ends poverty, because if you can create anything you want just by merely, you know, coming up with a design for it or... It, it, the replicator being intelligent enough to design stuff, that's it, you'll cure everything. You'll cure poverty, you'll cure hunger, you'll cure, cure everything. But of course, then corporations would probably patent the, uh, you know, the thing, the the plans, the blueprints that go in it. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, <laughs> so it, the, you, we'll probably never win. There's probably still be, you know, companies at the, at the, uh, at the control of everything. Well, don't ask me exactly how the replicator would work. If I knew, I'd patented it once. Definitely. Confronted with such a device, our present society would probably sink into a kind of gluttonous barbarism because everybody would want unlimited quantities of everything since nothing would cost anything. Mm. In fact, cynics may doubt if any human society could survive an invention which would lead to unlimited abundance and the final ending of the curse of Adam. And yet, you know, human could. beings are almost infinitely adaptable. Hmm, Look at the definitely. incredible changes we've experienced and survived from the Stone Age to the present time. And yet even greater changes are still to come. Because the future is not merely an extension of the present with bigger and better machines and cities and gadgets. It will be fundamentally different. And many of the things we take for granted will one day pass away as completely as, oh, spinning wheels and sedan chairs and oil lamps. And that is why the future is so endlessly fascinating, because try as we can, we'll never outguess it. So that's it then. Well done to Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, he got a hell of a lot right, didn't he? Um, so... I apologise if I've talked too much during this video. Um, on my last video, one of the um, comments was that I paused the video far too often and talked too much, and they said they felt that I should play the video all the way through until the end before I commented. But I find that, to do a reaction video, I find that really difficult because, obviously, you know, 
I'd have to remember everything that I'd seen in the video right at the end, which is just not going to happen because my memory, I've got a memory like a sieve. It, like short term memory is okay, long term memory, it just goes out the other end. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was a very intelligent prediction of the future. And clearly, I think he got a lot of stuff right. He got a lot of stuff possibly not right. And a lot of stuff still going to happen in the future. You know, we, we yet to know, time will, time will tell. I guess it's probably the correct way of doing it. I think for me personally, I got a lot of stuff wrong in the future. I think I still... I remember back in 1991 at school, I was asked to write like a you know, like a paper like you get, you know, in, in, in class. And, and it was, I chose the future and I chose to predict. And what I did was I wrote to a load of different companies, a load of different technology companies, a load of different hi-fi companies back in the day. And I wrote to everyone like Sony, um, Panasonic, um, oh, I can't remember who else now, Hitachi, I think um, Alba, Alba, I think it was Philips. And I wrote to all of these companies and I was really shocked. All of them sent me information back. And they were all predicting all of these things that they were going to do for the future, all of these new gadgets, you know, everything from the, obviously the VHS tape was already invented back then, but things like um, they were talking about laser disc, they were talking about um, DVD, was it was a bit too early for DVD, they weren't quite talking about DVD back then. Um, and they were talking about the Super Audio CD, the mini disc, the digital tape, all of these new formats that were going to take on, take off. And to go with what Arthur C. Clarke was saying, you never can predict the future because the only one of those companies that got it right were JVC. JVC predicted that there would be no formats in the future. They predicted it would be hard drive technology and everything would be just reduced to a file being played off a hard drive. And it just goes to show you all of these companies with all of their predictions in technology and, and very few of them eventually got it right. They all, and yes, there were different advances in technology, obviously, but in the future, there was no format. So JVC were right. One of the things that I predicted, or not predicted, I guess I one of the things I thought rather than predicted was that there would be fibre optic everywhere in the world and that people would be able to watch or listen to any content they wanted in the world at any time instantly like that. And I remember thinking that there will be companies that offer all of this content and you would be able to not necessarily hold the the film or the album, but you'd be able to stream it across the internet. I did 100% believe that in 1991. But I the things that I got wrong were proprietary, copyright. I assumed that because people could, they would. And I got it totally wrong. Because like now, yes, we have streaming services. We do have fiber optic cables going everywhere. That's true. But the content is still being edited, controlled, and withheld. So let's say, for example, you know, like how many streaming companies, if you want to watch a film, you have to find out what streaming company it's on. And then you've got to subscribe to what? You know, all these different companies from Disney Plus, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, um, Oh, um, did I say Paramount Plus? I can't remember. Um, oh, there's another one. I've, I've, the name forgets me as well. Um, HBO Max, or HBO. Um, all of these different content people. So just because you think people can doesn't mean they will. Just because people can invent technology, you've got copyright, proprietary, intellectual property. You know, you've got all of these things. And just because people can for example, cure a disease doesn't mean they will because there's always profit involved. So you know, it's like, would there be a cure for various disease? Well, there might be, or there may even be, but you wouldn't know. Uh, things are always controlled. Profit still reigns. And as long as it does, and I think even with a replicator, like we were discussing earlier, in theory, a replicator could end all of that. But it probably won't in the near future because the the replication patterns would be copyrighted or... In the replicator, you'd have to have that physical stuff in order to, you know, what do you make it out of? You've got to have the physical raw material first, don't you, to make something out of it, you know. So um, the future, the thing that shocked me about the future is that it feels we've gone backwards in time. Technology has improved, but the human condition hasn't. You know, we're still fighting wars. We're still about technology and companies. We're still about um, hating somebody who has a different viewpoint than us. We're still... Um, having prejudice we're still putting you know um getting angry or cutting people up and having road rage 
you know we're still going to war over resource in the world so the future for me is not as bright as I thought it would be even in the 90s as that child you know the Berlin Wall had come down the Cold War had ended people were talking to each other like never before countries were improving at a huge rate you know poverty was looked looked like on at least on the surface like it was starting to decrease you know people were starting to trade with each other become friends with each other travel was opening up in all sorts of areas of the world that was previously to me as a you know somebody from the west from the united kingdom was out of reach whereas now arguably the world is a more unstable place you know especially in the uk we've seen brexit and all sorts of things like that and we've seen people fracturing splitting apart not coming together and i find it really worrying I'm not going to lie. I really do. And I worry for the future. I worry that this is going to continue. And I hope it stops. We've seen radical politics taking hold in, and becoming mainstream. And it, it's worrying. It's like the lessons of the past, World War One, World War Two, are, are like, they're either not being learned or they're just being swept under the carpet for convenience. And perhaps I'm being overly dramatic. I don't know. I prefer to look at the future as a Star Trek future, where eventually poverty will be a thing of the past hunger will be a thing of the past prejudice may happen but you know it's not going to be anywhere to the level it is now um you know that we will all work together we will be one planet working together for the future and i hope i sincerely hope that happens anyway i've talked enough um if you like the video give me a thumbs up drop me subscribe if you can if not then uh, yeah that's f no problem cool i hope you enjoyed the video uh, yeah leave me some comments let me know what you think um as always don't be too harsh <laughs> especially on each other and me you know <laughs> just you know we all have different opinions different opinions are fine there's nothing wrong with that but let's be nice let's be nicer to each other anyway so yeah um that's me done for now i'll see you on the next video